So imagine that you're in the 1980s, right? Or maybe you're you weren't quite quite born yet. So I'm gonna give you a little a little detail on how the 1980s was. Uh, we'll separate some of the the uh, fact from the mythologies. Back in the 80s, there was no streaming. There was no internet. I mean, it was a pretty uh, analog time period. It's pretty primitive. And if you wanted to watch something, you had to see something either on cable television or you had to go rent, rent, rent it from the local video store, right? And video stores were in every town. They're in every community. They're in gas stations. They're everywhere. And that was kind of a main mode of how people actually got uh, their cinema, right? Now, let's say you're a fan of horror movies. Well, at the time, you know, the horror movies were basically things like uh, Friday the 13th, and it'd be like probably part five, part six, part seven, who knows, somewhere in that ballpark, right? And then, of course, you had Friday, the, uh, or you had uh, Nightmare on Elm Street, and Freddy went from this kind of creepy character that kills you in your dreams to kind of like this wisecracking, ridiculous uh, trope. And then, of course, you had, you know, the, the, B, the B zombie movies, and you had... Uh, you know, slasher movies out the wazoo and you know you know you used to watch those more to watch you know chicks bang some dude and then watch them get killed and of course they they got more and more elaborate they got more and more ridiculous right well you're sitting in the video store and you're looking at the horror section and at the new releases you see a movie and it's called hellraiser so you're like so you rent it you take it home and you slip it in and you start watching it and within the first three or four minutes of the movie you see this guy get uh, basically pulled apart by chains and you hear this voice this kind of lumbering british voice uh come over and, and start talking about suffering right and that's the opening of hellraiser and hellraiser uh was real a, really a game changer in the 80s and just like clive barker's uh literary work which kind of got, got where he kind of made a name for himself the actual film hellraiser really even though it was low budget and you know some of the special effects are kind of clunky, but they were still pretty imaginative. And, and he talked about a lot of things which were not really explored just yet in, uh, in not just horror cinema, but just in cinema in general and just in storytelling. And in this installment, I'm going to talk specifically about just this movie and get, get a little detail about it and hopefully uh, inspire people to actually go out and rent it or download it or whatever to see it. So here we go. Um, the movie was made in 1985, and it was actually shot in Britain. Although, uh, for the to get uh, financial backing, Clive had to uh, make a few concessions, and of course, one of it was he had to change the story from the novella *The Hellbound Heart* from a quintessentially British story to a quintessentially American story. So all the central characters, with the exception of Julia, were all American, or they had American accents, right? And uh, now, uh, Frank, who was the, the guy that gets ripped up in, in the first op the opening salvos of the movie, actually was British, but his voice was dubbed by an American. And it's pretty obvious if you look, if you kind of listen really close and look really close, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. But no, the, the rest of them... Uh, or, play, or played by either American or Canadian actors or whatever. Now, the story revolves around uh, the, the, this guy who's played by uh, the same actor that played the psycho in the original, uh, in the original uh, Dirty Harry. Uh, and he inherits his uh, house from his mother, right? And his brother at some point was living there. And, of course, it, it never really comes flat out and says when uh, but his brother's name is frank and uh, he is kind of this real hedonistic kind of dude well as they're cleaning the house up moving stuff in and all this other uh, uh activity the the mother or the, or the wife julia who's played uh by a british actor and she's pretty good she's she was in a couple other horror movies but she uh she stumbles across this little box that has uh, a bunch of pictures in it. and of course they're naked pictures right and she begins to reminisce about this affair she had with Frank back, you know, before her and uh, Rory, who was the the husband, uh, they before they got married, right? And it's like in one in one scene they're actually doing it with her with her wedding dress on, right? So this is the kind of mentality that I mean, Frank will do anything; he don't care, right? And he just kind of you know he, he take takes care of, take take takes care of business and just walks the hell out, right? 
which is kind of an a-hole thing to do, but I mean, Julia finds it so, uh, so attractive. And so, I mean, so right, right then and there, you, you begin to realize that both these characters are kind of, <laughs> they're a little flawed, right? And Rory seems like a pretty nice guy. You know, he, he seems like a, a decent guy. Now his daughter is not Julia's daughter. His daughter actually had a different mother. Now in the book, it was uh, a friend and she, she was kind of friend zoned. Right. But it, it, it I think Clive Barker kind of changed that because it really didn't make a lot of sense. I mean, it, it, it just, it, it was, it was just a little weird. So he, he, uh, changed that from the friend zone situation in, into the, it being his, his daughter and Julia's stepdaughter. Right. But she automatically, Kirstie's what her name is. She automatically can't stand, uh, she can't stand her stepmom. Well, um, Julia, the wife learn, you know, she yearns for Frank to come back and she yearns for that passion and that, and that, you know, excitement and all that stuff. Right. Well, um, when Rory is moving a couch, he strikes his hand and it starts bleeding. He, he, he you know, there's like a nail or something sticking out and it, it catches his hand. It starts bleeding pretty bad. Well, of course he, he walks into the bedroom where, uh, Frank disappeared Okay, and you see the blood drip, and it hits the hits the ground, and all of a sudden Frank reforms. But it's not Frank; it's this weird skeleton creature that has some muscles and some uh, some some uh, tissue, but no real um, no real form to it, no skin, nothing like that. And of course, you know, Julie goes up there and sees him, and at first she's you know freaked out. She tries to get out, and of course she hears his voice. You know, and it's like it's me, it's Frank. You know, and and, and then she stops. Right. Well, them two. Uh, begin to kind of uh, reconnect in a, in a very odd way uh, because, you know, I mean, he is half-formed. And, uh, well, Julia conspires with Frank to get him back, you know, back to being healthy because she yearns for his passion. So she actually goes out and starts luring guys in, in, into this house. And, and, of course, you know, she'll kill them. And then uh, Frank will slowly absorb absorb their, uh, their uh, uh, body, you know, their body, you know, their tissue and stuff like that, right? It's pretty disgusting when you see it on, on celluloid. Now, uh, Kirsty begins to kind of suspect something's up. And she begins to kind of kind of think that maybe uh, Julia is uh, up to no good, right? Well, she somehow gets her hands on a puzzle box, right? And she begins to kind of fiddle around with it. And all of a sudden, she figures out how to open it. And when she opens it, of course, uh, you know the room the room goes black, and everything everything turns in, into uh, you know a lot of dark light and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, the Cenobites appear. Now, the Cenobites were actually the creatures that tore Frank up in the fir- in the first of the movie. And they're some sort of inter- weird interdimensional beings. And you know, as Pinhead states early on in the movie, you know, you know we're, we're angels to to some and demons to others, right? So that right there sets up that they're not of, of this world. And that is a very common trope in Clive Barker's uh, canon. He likes he likes to set up alternate worlds. Now, of course, he, in cinema, he's only done that twice, once with Hellraiser and, of course, the second time with Near Dark. But in the no, in his novel or his uh, his literary, literary work, he's done it several times. You know, Weave World, there's a tapestry and The Great and Secret Show, there was a world within a world and, you know, all these different stories, and uh, there was a short story I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but you like you undo knots and like demons appear and stuff like that. It's it's a very fascinating concept, it's kind of an alternate reality, very H.P. Lovecraft, all right? Well, um, the Cenobites themselves are these weird creatures that have like all this body modification, and they wear like these weird leather clothes, and and they they, they carry around these these in, these like torture instruments, and they they just look disgusting, right? Now keep in mind this was long before. Uh, the new, you know, the new primitives and tattoos and body piercings, all that stuff became common. That that, that started becoming common in the '90s, in the mid to late '90s. That's when you started really seeing that. At this time, it's like you never saw stuff like that. I mean, if you saw a guy with a tattoo, he was typically a biker or a sailor, right? And especially, you know, in like the the middle of America and in the South and places like that, you really didn't see things like that. And it kind of opened opened the eyes to a lot of film goers as that there was kind of this other world that kind of uh, existed and also a lot of the themes you know the the you know pain and pleasure merging together and stuff like that i mean it's kind of a little subtle nod to s&m which again was something that the polite people didn't really talk about 
you know, it was something that, you know, weird people did. And, and Clive kind of wove, woven into his story, right? So anyway, uh, Julia, uh, actually negotiates a deal with, uh, with, uh, Pinhead, who's the central, uh, the central Cenobite. Now in the book, Pinhead is, is described as a woman, right? It's a very feminine humanoid type creature, but in the movie, it's a guy, it's played by Doug Bradley, who quint- coincidentally actually worked with Clive Barker when Clive Barker was a playwright when he was a young man uh, over in England. They were both in the same acting troupe. And so Doug, or I'm sorry, Doug, uh, Pinhead basically says, look, if you bring me, uh, if you bring me Frank, you know, we'll let you go, right? Or, or, or bring this, to, you know, and we'll, we'll, you know, we'll forget this ever happened, right? And of course she does, you know, she, and, well... When she gets back to the house, she realizes that her dad, Frank's not there, but her dad's there, but her dad's acting really weird. And he starts acting super, super rapey, right? And he's saying like all this like really creepy stuff. And it's just, you have to see the movie, you know what I'm talking about, right? So she figures out pretty quickly that somehow um, Frank stole her father's identity and basically is living in his skin in a very literal form. And Julia and Frank are trying to lure her into the bedroom right that's kind of because you know frank is a total he don't care he's just a total absolute nut job heatness he don't care i mean you know he, he probably you know experimented with pedophilia and a bunch of other stuff or at least it's implied as much right so he's 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 hitting on all cylinders right so uh kirsty actually summons the uh, the cenobites and that's when they begin to kind of they rip up uh well, first, Frank kills Julia, right? And then the Cenobites basically uh, take both Julia and Frank's souls, and they rip them up again. And it's a famous scene where, like, you can see him all, you know, with, with all these chains and stuff pulling his flesh out and all these other weird things. And uh, so anyway, um, that movie really... Like I said, it was a real game changer as far as horror movies went. I mean, you, we it, 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 nothing like that had ever been seen before. That's not, you know, and uh, nowadays it's a little bit more common because you know, you've got people like Eli Roth and James Wan. Some of these people are a little more adventurous. You know, the, the movies have gotten more gory and they've gotten a little more over the top. At the time, that was and and the funny thing about it was it wasn't it didn't seem exploitive, even though it kind of was. It wasn't you know the typical you know two teenagers fucking and some you know mass killer comes in and kills both of them right where they're still in bed i mean it wasn't like that it was it was a lot there's a lot more depth to it even though the story story is pretty simple and uh now unfortunately uh hellraiser suffered from the same psychosis that uh jason and and uh and uh Jason and uh, Freddy Krueger did in the sense that they've made a ton of sequels and most of them, they were not very good. As a matter of fact, when you start getting to like the fourth, fifth, and sixth installments, it kind of kind of got away from the original mystery and the mystique of, of the first one. They should have, you know, this, this is me sounding like a total neckbeard fanboy here, but they should have stopped at the second, maybe the third one. That's what They, they should have stopped it right then. But uh, they kept it going and, and it's still, and they, they've been talking about doing a uh, remake for years, but I think Clive, you know, he, he can't get funding or, or something, or, or, or they don't want to do it the way he wants to, or so, something weird like that, right? But anyway, it actually uh, pulled Pinhead into the horror lexicon, where you show a picture of him and most horror fans and most movie fans know, know who the hell he is. I mean, he's, he's very much in, in, that, uh, in that world. And uh, uh, now, Clive actually tried to recreate that success when he made Nightbreed a couple years later, and it, it didn't do very well. It's since gained a, a, a huge cult following, but at the time it didn't do very well. And the same thing with his last movie, which was Lords of Illusion, the last movie he directed. And since then, he's done like some, occasionally he'll produce something, and occasionally he'll uh, write on something. But he's went, he went, basically went back to writing, and he kind of got away from doing horror, and went back into dark fantasy, and then... And, uh, and within recent years, he's kind of come back to doing horror novels. Uh, he did it uh, in 2006. He did Cold Heart Canyon, and then Mister Be Gone, and then he did a a sequel, a direct sequel to The Hellbound Heart. Right. So, but the, but like I said, the impact of the film is basically the the look of it. It's very dark, very sinister, very kind of unique looking, and also the themes, the themes of sexuality, the themes of S and M, the themes of. Uh, 
you know, dysfunctional families and, and you know, dysfunctional sexuality and all these things were really explored in this story in, to, a, to a very uh, keen effect. And so, yeah, for, uh, it, um, it certainly is one of the better horror movies ever made. And uh, hopefully, uh, if you haven't seen it, I, 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 if you don't mind watching, because like I said, the effects look kind of, kind of low budget by today's standards but they're, you got to keep in mind they're practical effects they didn't really have cgi and of course even if they did have it you know clive barker couldn't really afford it so but hopefully uh this uh people will go out and see this movie because it's, it's a really it's a really good movie and if you're into things that are a little a little different a little unusual and you wonder why this character is so iconic that would be it so anyway uh i'm glad to uh to share with you and uh if you like this put a like down there and i'll talk to you guys later see ya